this issue we've got a very unique project. It's a book stand, or it could even be used as a podium, depending on your application. However, its true intended purpose is that of a book stand. Now, you may be wondering, why on earth would anybody want something of this nature? Well, consider for a moment that if you place the family Bible on the book stand, and you place this in a prominent room in your home where everyone passes by, each of you can take turns selecting a verse out of that Bible that you can refer to and reflect on each day. Or perhaps you could dig out of that closet those old photo albums and place one on the book stand, open it up to some favorite photographs of years gone by to bring back some of those wonderful memories. Either way, it's a fun project. It's a very unique project. Uh, its overall design allows a lot of flexibility. Uh, you could use just about any species of wood that you'd want on it. Um, because of the shape and the curves of the legs and so forth, there aren't a lot of exacting dimensions that you have to follow. Uh, there's some guidelines along the way to help uh, everything line up properly, but believe me, you have a lot of latitude with the overall design. Now we'll get started right away on the project by working on the base. I didn't have a single piece of stock large enough to make the base out of one piece of material, so I'm going to have to split mine in half. Now this will be the one jointed edge, this will be the other jointed edge where the two pieces come together like so. Now out of this material, I'm just going to rough cut away the rest of this waste. This surface here I'm going to do as close of a job as I can get to cutting it on the bandsaw as a nice perfectly straight edge. Then we'll pass this over the jointer on both of these surfaces so that we've got a nice straight, true, flat edge, and then we'll join the two pieces together and cut the shape out after the glue dries. Now you'll notice that this joint isn't actually long grain to long grain. These two boards come together at an angle, basically 25 degrees. So this surface isn't technically a long grain surface. It's somewhat of an end grain. Um, being at this angle, it's, it's one of those things where you could probably glue it up and it'll be okay, but I'm not going to take a chance. So I'm going to reinforce this joint with four number 20 biscuits. Two from this face, two from the other face. This material is one inch thick, so I can accommodate four total biscuits. So I'll just lay them out and cut the slots, and then we can assemble these two halves. Now I'll just be using yellow woodworking glue. Make sure I get it in my biscuit slots good. And with odd shaped parts like this, you always have to get pretty creative with your clamping strategy. Now as you can see here, we're clamping against this tapered area, so if we were to just clamp it this way, the clamps want to walk off the end of the part. So I put two clamps here as a stop and clamped against those. Same thing up at this end. Put two clamps here, clamped against those, and then that way nothing slides apart on me. As you can see, the glue's dried on my base, and what I'm doing now is going through the rest of the layout because our next step is to cut out the shape. So I'm just using my template and some other devices to finish up that layout. Our next place is at the bandsaw. Now when we cut this shape out, we want the sides to taper up and in towards the top. That would be the two sides and then the front edge. The back edges and the inside shape and the V area, that all gets cut vertical or straight. So in order to get our angles right, based on the tilt of my bandsaw tilting down like so, I did my layout on the bottom surface. So that way when I'm cutting through like this, it gets smaller near the top. So now it's just a matter of cutting along my layout lines. Now to clean up those bandsaw edges, you could use a hand plane. Um, in this case, I've got enough knots where I'm a little bit too worried about uh, having some problems, so I'm just going to tilt my joiner fence back at 10 degrees and pass it over. And the 
rest of the surfaces, just get sanded up with whatever tools you have available to you. For the top, you could use 3 quarter inch hardwood plywood, and that would be perfectly fine. However, I wanted to use uh, the veneer that's going to match my front panel, so I'm going to be laying up my own plywood, so to speak. I'm going to start out with half inch thick MDF. Now I didn't have or couldn't find one inch thick MDF, so I'm going to laminate together two pieces of half inch thick MDF. So I'll cut up that core material now. At this stage, I am going to cut it oversized and then trim it up and square it up later on. For an adhesive, I'm just using yellow woodworking glue, and I'll get a nice film spread around the entire piece. Now if you don't have a vacuum press, what you could do is have another piece of material about the same size as this, preferably two, one for the bottom, one for the top, to act as calls. Then you would clamp that whole assembly together with as many clamps as you have. To further help distribute that clamping force, you could use conventional calls as well, clamped across the surface this way. I have a vacuum bag, so that makes it a little bit easier for me. So we'll transfer this into the bag, clamp it up, and then we can move on to the next step. Now before I put this in the bag, I did take and knock over these corners a little bit so that they won't puncture my vacuum bag. Now we'll let this sit in here for about a half hour, and then we can take it out. Now I want to apply the veneers to my core material. Now for the bottom surface, for a balance sheet, I'm just using a piece of maple. This has a little bit of figure in it, but it's a relatively low grade piece. For the top, I'm going with the same material that I'm using for that front piece. Same veneer, um, but it wasn't wide enough, so I got to seam two pieces together. And as luck would have it, I've got a perfect seam here where the two pieces bump up. Generally, you don't uh, have that uh, fortunate advantage at this point. You have to joint that edge, but that's a subject of another story. But we do have to tape that together, and I'll be using gummed veneer tape. And what we'll do, we'll just pull the joints together good and tight and apply the tape. And I'll just work my way along the whole seam, getting it taped together real good, and then we can glue it up and put it in the vacuum bag. Now that the glue's had a chance to dry up real well on the top panel, I've sanded it up uh, pretty smooth at this point. I'm not going for a finished sand yet. Now what we need to do is square this up, trim up the edges and get it to size, and then apply some edge banding around it to conceal the MDF core. Now my edge banding turned out I had some material that I could get to about 7 16 of an inch thick as opposed to a half inch. So that's going to work perfectly fine. I don't think anybody's going to notice that 16th inch difference. So we'll get started here first by jointing one of the edges over at the jointer so that we've got a nice square straight edge to start with. Now with the jointed edge against my fence, I can rip the other side to get my overall width. And now with my shop made panel cutting sled, which holds my workpiece square to the blade, I can take and trim up the one end, flip it end for end, and trip up the other end to get the overall length. Well, as you can see, the thickness of my top is currently one inch 55 thousandths. One inch and 62 thousandths would be an inch and a sixteenth. So I want to cut my stock a little bit wider than that. Now that would be for the three, the two side pieces and then what would be the, the front piece. The near or back piece, the one that would be uh, at the downside of the top, there's, it's actually going to be an inch and a quarter wide because you don't want the books to slide off the top. So that one will be an inch and a quarter and the others will be slightly more than an inch and a sixteenth. Now as you can see I've got everything rough cut to size at this point. Now what we need to do is miter the corners and bring everything together to assemble it. Now to make these nice tight fitting miters I like to use the table saw. Compound miter saws are a wonderful tool but I find that doing it at the table saw I gain greater precision. Never trust the calibrations on your machines. Whenever possible use drafting triangles or precision squares to do your setups. And now we can go through and miter one end on all four pieces. Now what we need to do is figure out where to cut off the other end to. What I'm going to do is flip it upside down 
and I've got two pieces of my material on the sides of my core. I'll bring my back piece into position, slide it up so that it's flush out here at this end, and at this end I'll slide another piece up, bump it up against my point here, and then I can make my mark. Now at this point I'm marking the long side of our angle cut, and because I know my pencil line is on the outside of this, I could actually remove the entire pencil line and I'd still be okay. But what I'll do is try to split that pencil line during my cutting operation. And that fits up real good. Three more to go, and then we can assemble our banding onto the core material. Along the top edge of our stop, we need to have that little curvy cutout on there. With so little material, it just makes sense to go over to the spindle sander and sand away the excess. Just be sure to leave a little bit of the line so you can flush sand it up after assembly. Now we can assemble everything. I'll start out by applying glue. I have tape handy to help hold the pieces in place. And if needed, I also have some edge clamps, but I don't know if those will be necessary or not. And we'll just work our way right back around again. Like the base, the legs will be made up of several pieces in this case. I don't have any boards wide enough to get each of the two leg pieces out of a single piece of material. So what I've done is I've gone through, following the dimensions on our drawings, I've created a couple of templates. Uh, what I'm going to be considering is each of the two side legs, I'm going to split that up into four total pieces, a front leg and a back leg, and then they'll be joined, of course, at one point. So I've very carefully taken the time to create a couple of uh, templates made out of poster board, and then there's an area marked on there, a flat area. And of course, that's the area where the front and back legs will join together. Now, trying to get this very unusual shape out of a straight piece of wood can be a very complex, complicated procedure. But what we've done on the drawing, and as we'll present it here, is we'll take you through the progression. There's about four steps to get from our solid piece of wood down to a piece of wood that looks like this. Now our first step is of course to get our stock cut to its approximate over. I'm going to leave it a little bit long to start with and then we're going to rip it to the width shown for our blank material. So we'll go over to the table saw and the compound miter saw to get these cuts out of the way. After getting my stock squared up at the ends, cut a little bit long, and ripped to about five and a half inches wide, I then took my template, laid it on my stock, traced around everything, and I also made notations as to where that flat area is, because that's somewhat of a critical dimension. Now what we'll do here at the compound miter saw is cut off our overall length following the angles on our diagram. And this would be, so to speak, the second step. The first step, preparing the stock, the second step, cutting it off to length. Now up here at the top end, it works out to 21.9 degrees, or 111.9 minus 90 to get that angle. And then of course we'll do the same thing at the bottom end. Okay, that's good. What I'm doing now in step number three of our legs is to do a double check. Now templates are great, but it's easy to make a mistake tracing around them and so forth. So on the drawing in step number three for our legs, uh, for example, this is the back leg and this is the top end. We measure from this point up to here and it should be three and three quarters of an inch. Then from this point coming down until we just meet with this outside edge at 29 and an eighth inches away, our taper should line up perfectly with that flat area. Now you could set up a tapering jig on your table saw and cut this away, but actually I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to start out by band sawing away this material and then I'll plane or joint this edge so that we get our flat surface right in this area. And of course I've got that marked out very clearly. So let's go over to the band saw and get that waste material removed. While using the bandsaw, I'm going to cut up close to the line, but I don't want to cut exactly to the line. 
I want to leave some material there so that I can either use my jointer or a hand plane to get a nice smooth surface on that flat area. Now if you're real careful with your cut along that flat surface, you could actually go right over to your jointer and pass your stock over like so to clean up that edge and put a nice finished edge on there so that we can join the front and back halves together. But if you don't get it feeding across just right, you can really very easily alter this angle and that will really mess up the geometry for the rest of our project. So let's go to a more passive technique. Now I've got my two legs, two back legs clamped together here. Um, I've lined them up very carefully and right here is our flat area. And this we need to have of course a nice flat smooth surface so that we can join the two legs together. And I do want to make sure that I follow my layout line very accurately. So a hand plane is actually an excellent choice for this operation. A belt sander or even a regular sander would work fine as well. Now my legs, as they're clamped together, the one at the back side's a little bit taller than the one at the front. So I'm just roughing that one down real quick. Now I'm a little bit low here and a little bit high back here, so I need to remove a little bit more material on the back side. Now that I've got the surface relatively flat, close to my layout line, I want to take a square and make sure that my edges that I'm machining now are in fact square to my faces. Now at this point, you can go through and shape out the convex portion of the rest of the curve here. And of course you can do that with your hand plane as well, or belt sander, or whatever tool you're using at this time. So now we'll go through, get that same mating flat surface on the, the other leg half, and then I'll shape up this convex curve. Well, this is what we've got so far for our legs. We've got our front leg and our back leg. We've got the area jointed where they meet up with each other. We've got our top and bottom edges miter cut at the proper angles, and we've got these inside curves all machined up and, and uh, playing nice and smooth. Now, our next two cuts is to cut the curve at the back edge of the back leg. That one will be square to the faces. Then we've got a curve cut on the front leg. That one will be at a bevel. So we'll get started on the back leg. That's just a simple operation over at the bandsaw or even using a handheld jigsaw. Take your time, make a nice smooth, even cut following closely with your layout line. Remember, this is a concave surface, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult to finish it up. Now at this point, we have to make sure that we make a left and a right front leg. Notice here, the bevel going out. This is my left leg the bevel will go the opposite way on the right leg. So take your time, be very, very sure of your layout at this step. Now you'll see that I've got my bandsaw table tilted over at 25 and a half degrees, and that's to create that bevel cut that we need. It does feed fairly easily in this orientation. You have to be a little bit more steady with your hand, and this is perhaps when it's oftentimes better to use a jigsaw. The jigsaw, of course, you can tilt its base over at 25 and a half degrees and guide the tool around the work a little bit more easily. As I didn't have any attractive quarter inch thick plywood laying around, I decided to make my own in a process that I've done on a number of other projects. It starts out by taking some quarter inch thick hardboard or masonite as the trade name goes, and I'll rip that into a piece of material large enough to make that front panel out of. Now as mentioned, I'm making my own plywood in this case. Now to laminate the veneers onto the core material, I'm using liquid hide glue. I find that works best with veneers. Again, if you don't have a vacuum bag, you can certainly clamp this up with some calls. Just back, put a, a three quarter inch thick piece of plywood or birch below and on top of this so that you have good, solid, and even clamping pressure across the whole surface. Now I will be putting veneer on both sides of this so that it stays in balance. I don't really need to put this in calls with the vacuum bag. Normally you'll see me use a call on the top and the bottom, but I, I don't think it's going to 
help me out a lot because my bag is just barely big enough to hold this panel anyhow. But I am going to wrap some paper around it, heavy construction paper. Like so, and then we'll place this in the bag. And I've got just about an inch seam here where I can put a call, so I got lucky. One of the more tricky operations that we have to do is to machine a groove along the inside face of the two front leg portions. That groove needs to be a quarter inch wide if you're using quarter inch plywood. Um, in my case, my plywood is going to be a little bit thicker, so I'm using a 5 16 router bit. It needs to be 3 eighths of an inch back from this front edge, and it needs to be parallel to this edge, because this will be flat towards the front of our book stand. So we also want that panel, of course, to be flat and parallel to the front. It also needs to be 5 16 of an inch deep in here. Complicating everything, it's tilted back at that 25 and a half degree angle, and of course, as we continue along down this way, it's got to follow the curve on the front of the leg. Luckily, it's not going to be as difficult as you may at first think, but it is uh, critical to have one particular tool, and that would be a tilting base router. Now, my Porter Cable Laminate Trimmer, I purchased this one with a kit, and it has all sorts of attachments you can put at the bottom of it. One that's going to come in real handy on this project is this tilting base. Now I've already set the tilt angle to match that angle along the front edge of my leg, and I've got to yet adjust the height of the router bit. But other than that, it's actually going to be a pretty easy operation with this router. Now if you don't have a router with a tilting base, you could make a wedge that you could attach to the bottom of your router, and then that would give you the angle that you need. Again, that angle is shown on the drawings. Now we need to come up with a, a fence or a guide system, and again, that's going to be pretty easy. We are quite fortunate in that we have two front legs. We're going to use one of them as our fence. Now I've gone through and measured my offset from this edge of my router base, the, the front edge, to the edge of my router bit. So that gave me one and seven eighths of an inch. So I made a mark at each end, one and seven eighths of an inch over from my slot position, I'll bring the other leg in, line it up on those marks, clamp everything down on my workbench, and we're ready to cut. Now we've got our fence, we've got our router, we've got it tilted at the angle, we set our depth and we'll make the cut. Now at this point with the legs, I've got these inside curves, the convex portion sanded up good and smooth. Of course, we've got our jointed surface here our bevel on the front, and the groove for our plywood front panel. Now we need to join these two pieces together. We've got a perfect long grain to long grain area here, so we really don't need any reinforcement. I'm not even going to bother with biscuits or anything. But clamping it with this bevel on the front could be a challenge. Now it's just going to take a few steps here to get everything lined up, and I'd like to explain it. This block here is the cutoff piece from this part of the leg. It's beveled going in, so as I pull back on it, it's pulled down against the table. So that's a great block for helping us with clamping. Now what we want at this end is for our two leg bottoms to sit flat and parallel to each other. That will help bring everything into alignment. So what I've done is I've taken this end with my front leg, set it so that it's flat against this board at the end, it's just a cleat I've clamped on the bench, slid that forward up onto my clamp. Now my back leg, that is parallel against the board here, and my flat area where the two boards join together is meeting up perfectly. Now if there is some misalignment here, don't worry about it, we can trim that up after everything's uh, glued up and, and set. So we'll get some glue on here, glue it up, clamp it up, and we'll do the same for the other leg. And that's all there is to it, just some snug clamping pressure to bring that joint together, and then we'll let everything sit and dry. I finished up yesterday by sanding everything up. It's pretty well finished sanded at this point, except for some detailing. Now I've gone through and I've cut my top and bottom templates that serve 
for helping us with assembly. They hold the legs out at the right angle and give us some stability while we're doing some of these steps. And I've got it sitting on our base. Now you're looking at the profile of it and I'm going to spin it around to the front. Now keep in mind this is all taped together at this point so we do want to be very careful. And here's the front view of it. Now you can see how those flat legs that were flat from the sides, because they're curved front to back, create this shape in this area. Now what we need to do is fit up this plywood panel, and that's probably something you've been wondering. How am I going to cut that thing to shape? Well, it's really not going to be that bad. What we're going to do is uh, cut the bottom in so that it's square and flat. Then what we're going to do is take that plywood panel and either tape or clamp it to the front edge of our legs. Then from the back side, what we're going to do is trace along this line. That will create the inside profile of it. Now we will have to add some width to it to make up for the distance to get out to the grooves or so that the panel actually fits in the groove. And we'll have to of course make a measurement there too. So the next step is to get my plywood panel attached to the front of my legs. A couple of clamps holds everything in place. Now we can work on the inside surface. Now I'll just trace along that inside edge with a pencil. Now I've removed that plywood panel and I'm putting a scale in here. And what I want to do is sight through to see where this edge is so I can measure from this point where we trace the profile for our contour into the depth of our groove and it appears that I'm pretty close to a half of an inch. So that'll be how much I add to each side of our contour. Now you're probably not going to see our layout lines on camera because of the dark wood and a dark pencil line, um, but they come along here. Now of course we want our panel to be wider and I've got a, t a little strip of wood here, a half inch wide. And What I'm going to do is just work along the edge of my line making a series of little marks. And then what I'll do is connect all those little dots and I'll have a cut line. Then using a bandsaw or even a jigsaw we can cut away the waste material. Now I will warn you right away you're going to have two layout lines at each location. One was the inside edge of our leg, the other was our cut line. So pay close attention to which line you cut. Where the bottom edge of our front panel meets up with the base it's going to be at an angle, well, roughly about three degrees. So what I want to do is just kind of back bevel this a little bit so that the front surface comes down and meets up with the base nice and tight. Just a sanding block will do the trick. Now as I mentioned before we need to make sure that our leg fits up nice and flat on the top of our base. Our legs are tilted in somewhere between two and three degrees. Now the best way to get an accurate measurement is to use a bevel gauge, have it square to the leg, and then bring it into contact. Tilt the arm until it's flush with the leg and of course flush at the base. Now we'll lock that in place and to trim the bottoms of the legs I'm going to be using my small trim circular saw. And that's just the most precise tool I have for this. I couldn't really use this or do this on the table saw or the miter saw so a circular saw is really about the best tool. Now using the bevel gauge we tilt our base so that the blade lines up with our bevel gauge. And we're all set. I'll lock it in and now we're ready to start cutting. Now up here at the top we've got sort of a compound angle. Now this one angle we're pretty well set on but this angle isn't the same as it is at the bottom. So while we have everything set up here we'll set our bevel gauge to match that angle as well. When I had the legs assembled on the base I took a moment to make a parallel line to that base. That's just an indicator so I get my bevel angle just right. Now I've measured up the offset distance from the edge of my base plate on my circular saw to the ends of the, the legs because this is square and flat at this point. Clamped on a straight edge and now we're ready to trim up those legs. Now to make sure that both legs are the same length I've gone through, measured up which one was my shorter one, and then I bevel cut that one. Now on mine, at the bottom it worked out to about two and a half degrees, and at the top about six and a half degrees. So after I got the one leg trimmed up for its overall length at the top end, 
I place that on top of the other leg, and then now I've just made my mark. And that shows me at the peak, at the highest point of where I want that leg to be. Now again, I'll measure my offset for my circular saw base and finish up that last cut. I've gone through and finished sanded up all the surfaces and now we're ready to start some assembly. Now the first thing we need to do is get our front panel into our two legs. I, in my dry run through this assembly, it did not go real easy. It would have been much easier to have an assistant with me. But I'm going to do it on my own and we'll see how it comes out. Now I'm going to be using a slow setting glue, liquid hide glue, that just gives me enough time where I can work through all these assembly steps and not have to hurry. Now you'll notice I'm trying to apply the glue along the back edge of our groove as opposed to the front edge and that way I should have less of a problem of any squeeze out. Now we'll take our panel and we're going to curve it and slide it in our groove. This is where an assistant could be a big help and we got it in there pretty well. We want the bottom to be nice and flush. Seat that in there. Now we'll apply glue in the other leg's groove. And then things get real busy. Now we'll just try to slide the two pieces together. And if you don't have an assistant, you may want to just get the panel glued into the one piece first and then work on the other piece later. It might work out a little bit easier. Once you get it in, make sure your bottom is flush and then start applying tape to help hold the pieces together. Now you'll see I've got my top assembly jig installed. Now I'll stand it up and put the bottom one in. Now here you can see I've put my top assembly template in, my bottom assembly template, and I've got some tape pulling the sides together in this area. Now I'll stand everything back up on its base and check for fit everywhere. Due to the shape of everything on here, there's really not a lot of clamping you can do. So it's just a matter of taping everything together, getting it pulled together as tight as you can, and then just let that glue do its job. I've gone through and centered up my leg system on the base. I've slid it forward and backward until I got about a quarter inch wide step between the leg and the top surface of the base. That'll kind of dictate how far forward or backward you'll have the legs relative to the base. Then I centered it up left to right. Now you might be wondering why the base extends out forward of the front and further off the back of it. Well that's to increase stability. This is a relatively tall heavy object that has a fairly small and narrow base. By extending this out a little bit what we do is increase the stability by lowering the center of gravity. So it's just a, a functional item as well as somewhat of a decorative because it does look rather attractive with this point coming out, sort of like a ship's bow. After I got everything centered up, I marked the location at the center on each side of my leg, transferred that mark down onto the base, and drew a pencil line representing the outer edge of the leg. What we're going to be doing is using biscuits to attach the legs to the base. Now in order to help keep everything in alignment when I'm cutting my biscuit slots, I've clamped a, a piece of scrap stock on top of the base. That's lined up perfectly flush with my layout lines representing the outside edge of the legs. And then the two larger pencil lines are the center line point of where I want my biscuits to be. That will make it very easy to cut the biscuit slots with the biscuit joiner oriented like so. So I'll cut these two, do the other side, and then in a similar process we'll cut the slots at the bottoms of the legs. Now when we cut the biscuit slots on the base and we did the layout, we were referencing the outside face of the leg. So when we do the biscuit slotting on the bottom of the leg, we need to reference that same outside surface. So as you can see, I've got the leg assembly clamped on top of my workbench, and this was the surface of the biscuit joiner that we bumped up against that scrap piece of stock when we cut the slots on the base. So now we'll bump it up against our workbench surface and cut the slots in this orientation. That way we maintain the same reference surface from the outside face of the leg 
to our slot location on the leg as well as the way we did it on the base. And by the way, these are number 10 biscuits. And that's fitting up real good. Now what we'll do is we'll go through, make sure everything is finished sanded before we glue the legs to the base. There's really not much you can do for clamping, perhaps a couple of cross from top to bottom. And then the top will actually get assembled and, and installed the same exact way. And with all the sanding out of the way, we can glue everything up. Start out by attaching the legs to the base. And then once that sets up a little bit, we'll move on to the top. And the number 10 biscuits. Then the leg assembly. And we'll see if a band clamp won't help hold everything together good and tight. Now to keep the band from sliding forward on the base, I just put a couple of clamps against the base like that. And we'll just snug that up. And that should do it. We'll let the glue set up. I'll repeat the process for the top and then we can move on. Now you may have noticed in previous scenes, I let my panel run long at the top. Now what I'll do is trim that up using a flush trim saw. For a finish, I'm using tongue oil and I'm just going to brush it on with a foam brush and get a nice wet coat on there and I'll keep it wet for a minute or two allowing the wood to soak up what it will and then I'll wipe off the excess with a dry rag. Now depending how it looks at that point I may go for a coat of wipe on oil and urethane and that will of course uh, protect the finish and the wood a little bit more than just pure tongue oil um, but it will bring up the gloss and the build and I'm not sure if I want this piece to have that or not so I'm playing it by ear. We'll see how it looks after the coat of tongue oil dries and we'll make the decision at that time. The only trick to wiping it off is to do your best to wipe it off to an even sheen. In other words, wipe the surface evenly so that there aren't any shiny spots. Well, I just wasn't pleased with the finish that the tongue oil was giving me. It just didn't have quite the texture and feel that I wanted. So what I'm doing is applying a couple of coats of a wipe-on oil and urethane top coat product. Very easy to apply. Just apply it with a, a cotton wad dipped in the solution, wipe it on, with that same wet rag, then even up the surface by taking long even strokes across the surface with a light touch. Well that completes the construction of our book stand. Now the one last step you'll need to do is select an appropriate foot or pad for the bottom of the base depending on the type of floor that this is going in. Now you'll of course need to find a nice place in your home and a good book to place on it perhaps a photo album, whatever seems to work for your family environment. I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home. Thanks for watching.